Collingwood Football Club have found themselves in hot water following the release of Do Better, independent review into Collingwood Football Club's responses to incidences of racism and cultural safety in the workplace. The report is not written by independent researchers, but by activists who use dodgy methodologies, scare quotes, as well as deliberately vague definitions of specific social justice activism to Trojan horse a crusade of social justice across the AS AFL and further divide Australians by race. My fellow Australians, I'm John Andrews and welcome to another episode of Advancing Australia. From the Collingwood Football Club's homepage, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional custodians on the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to them, their culture and elders past and present, end quote. From The Guardian, quote, Collingwood Football Club's culture of structural racism condemned in scathing report. Lorena Allam and Mike Heitner, 1st of February, 2021. Quote, leadership on anti-racism from highest levels, including the board, called to replace double down, deny and deflect response. Collingwood has a problem with structural racism that its senior leadership must address and it should publicly make amends to those who have paid, quote, a very high price, end quote, for speaking out about it in an independent investigation has found. The report does not rule out fi final financial compensation. It said making amends could include reparations, compensation, public apology and commitments to reform. The report called Do Better, which, ha which was commissioned by the board in June 2020, has been in front of them since at least December 17. Produced by the University of Technology S Sydney's distinguished professor, Yawaralara woman, Larissa Brent, it recommended sweeping changes to how Collingwood deals with, quote, toxic environment, end quote, of racism within its ranks. What is clear is that racism at the club has played, has resulted in profound and enduring harm to First Nations and African players. The racism affected them, their communities, and set dangerous norms for the public, the report said. End quote. The, end quote. The article further says, quote, the report was, the report said comments by Harita Lumumba, were a trigger for the inquiry, but it was understandable that he did not wish to be involved. Brent said his claims deserved a full, invest, full and separate investigation. It is not appropriate to review those allegations without Mr. M Mr. Labomba's involvement. End quote. That's the Guardian article. As Labomba's complaints, which have been covered in the media and are at the moment subject to a court case between the parties, and as they are excluded from the report, I will not include that material in this critique of the report. Do Better, independent review into Collingwood Football Club's responses to incidents of racism and cultural safety in the workplace. That is the title of the report and the report is linked in the description. The report was published by the club's integrity committee. According to the report, quote, our terms of reference were framed as five questions. How effectively did the club, including staff, board and players, respond to allegations of racism? Were there appropriate supports to, provided by the club to respond to allegations of racism and ensure the cultural safety of all players, staff and board members? What changes in relevant policies, processes and systems have taken place and have these changes been effective? Are the current policies, processes and systems currently in place adequate? What changes are required to provide the clubs, to improve the club's response to racism in the future? End quote. So within the terms of reference, we see the use of the politically loaded term cultural safety. This is the first of many either undefined, ill-defined or nebulous terms appearing in the quote. These terms have competing meanings, both colloquial as used day to day and technical as used within the institutions of social justice activism and activist academia. Do Better was written by distinguished professor Larissa Brent and professor Lyndon Coombs and carries the logo of the University of UTS, a University of Technology Sydney, UTS, where both authors are employed. According to UTS Profiles website, quote, 
Distinguished Professor Larissa Brent OA is the Director of Research at the Jambana Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology, Sydney. She has an LLB, Bachelor of Law, and B. Juris, Bachelor of Jurisprudence from the University of New South Wales, and an LLM, Master of Law, and SJD, Doctorate of Juridical Science from Harvard Law School, end quote. Uh, and her dissertation at Harvard Law School for her Doctor of Juridical Science was titled The Recognition of Aboriginal Rights in Australia, A Study of Pluralism and the Politics of Identity. Okay, that's, that's a Doctor of Juridical Science, The Politics of Identity. According to Louisa Brent's own website in relation to her book, Achieving Social Justice, Quote, Larissa Brent attacks the chasm which has grown between Indigenous lives and aspirations in Australia and the psychological terra nullius which continues, despite Marvo, to pervade so much of Australia's mythology and policy. She proposes long-term aspirational initiatives leading to institutional change that will facilitate greater rights protection and the exercise of self-determination, including a preamble in the Constitution, a treaty, the national self-image, economic redistribution, alternative institutional forms, regional framework agreements, a, energized, a more energised politics, constitutional protection, end quote. So that's from her own website in regard to her own book. She's also the host of ABC Radio's Speaking Out program. Here are some of the titles of the show's episodes. Lydia Thorpe, Victorian's Green Senator. Lydia Thorpe is a former grassroots activist and social justice advocate seeking to make her mark on federal politics. And the art of sovereignty. What are the structural barriers to asserting indigenous sovereignty in Australia today? And writing and activism. How does storytelling have the ability to change human behavior and bring about social change? Okay, so a consistent theme of social change, social justice activism, wealth distribution, etc. According to his profile, Professor Lyndon Coombs is quote, industrial professor, Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research. Lyndon has worked in Aboriginal affairs for over 18 years in a range of positions. He is currently an industry professor at the Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Technology, Sydney, end quote. Given their activist backgrounds, the authors should in no way be considered to be unbiased, impartial, apolitical or fair, nor indeed experts in relation to the formulation, development and implementation of workplace policies, procedures or as professionals within human resources. Neither authors have any specific background, professional experience or expertise in those key areas in which the report makes many of its most important recommendations. Further, the report has been described as independent. Although the authors were commissioned because of their independence from the club, there is no possible way to view them as independent in relation to the topic or the material and, their in and the interpretation of the data they gathered. Any fair-minded or independent observer would clearly have a reasonable apprehension of bias in regards to the authors. The report. To analyse the report, it is useful to divide it into four sections. The executive summary and recommendations, a review and interpretation of Collingwood Football Club, including the first introduction of key concepts, and the report's interpretation of what the club and its values will be into the future, including another round of key concepts, the recommendations in depth, and the author's vision for the club of being a, quote, culturally safe workplace, end quote. And a final section that introduces the author's broader goals to implement their agenda across the entire AFL. A timeline for action and responsibilities for the club to implement its recommendations. The executive summary. The key to understanding this report is revealed in the executive summary by the phrase, quote, in the 30 interviews undertaken for this review, end quote. In 2020, the AFL released club membership numbers showing that Collingwood Football Club had 76,862 members. The 30 people surveyed in this report cannot be considered to be representative of the club, 
or could their responses be considered to be in any way representative of views about the club from within the club? The sample size is simply too small to make those conclusions, yet conclusions are made. Further, these are personal interviews, not the standardised surveys required to gain meaningful insights. The executive summary contains definitive statements such as there was no clear consensus about what the values of Collingwood Football Club were, or people we spoke to believe that Collingwood Football Club could do better, and it's hard to be a Collingwood supporter. Given the sample size and methodologies, there is no statistical basis to justify such sweeping and firm statements as fact. The sample size is, st is statistically insignificant. The 30 respondents represent 0.039% of the membership of the Collingwood Football Club. The executive summary criticises the club in that responses to incidences of racism were seen to be defensive rather than proactive. And that Collingwood was, quote, perceived as being defensive, doubling down and denying allegations instead of taking an active and proactive approach, end quote. Statements that cannot be supported with reference to the methods used to compile the data. Critically, the executive summary hinges on this paragraph towards the end. Quote, there needs to be a clearer process of complaint handling and policies around behaviour to give people who wish to make a complaint an avenue of redress. Without transparency, accountability and consequence, these policies and procedures will not lead to the shifts needed. End quote. However, much later in the main body of the report, on page 21 of 35 of a 15,000 word document, it is acknowledged that, quote, current policies are new, coming into, into effect in 2020. This has meant not only are the policies new, but there has, given the challenging climate of COVID-19, been limited opportunities to implement them and socialise them throughout the club. Further, it goes on to say that, quote, these new policies are significant in that they directly mention racism. It is interesting to note these changes are not credited in the executive summary as they are evidence of, of movement implemented by the board in 2020, specifically addressing racism through three separate actionable policies. It is uncharitable not to mention these revisions in the executive summary and it is similarly uncharitable to mention structural forms of racism in the club without defining the term or even giving an example. In fact, the term structure appears in the report 23 times and in each instance it is coupled to the words racism or change. The summary also contains 18 recommendations. I've linked the document below so you can find those yourself, but right now we'll just mention, we'll mention most of them but not all. Club values, one, the Collingwood Football Club undertake a process to integrate concepts of anti-racism through their behaviour and beliefs, oh, sorry, and inclusion as qualities inherent in the club's values, including the concept of excellence and the goal of winning. And three, that the Collingwood Football Club undertake a board audit to ensure its membership through their behaviour and beliefs reflects its goals of diversity and indiv individually embrace the values of the club including the principles of anti-racism and inclusion. A proactive response to racism. Four, that the Collingwood Football Club ensure, that, ensure the development of a framework for responding to incidents of racism that reflects its values in a way that is proactive, not reactive. Policies, procedures, mechanisms for complaints. Six, that the Collingwood, Foot Collingwood Football Club review its processes for addressing complaints of racism to improve them and to include an avenue for external, independent review and protection of whistleblowers. Seven, that the Collingwood Football Club implement a framework to ensure that there is accountability and consequences for acts of racism committed by members of the club community. Employment and recruitment. Nine, the Collingwood Football Club board ensure the development and impl implementation of an employment strategy that values diversity and reports against KPIs. Okay. This, in this includes the player group and the coaching staff. 10, that the Collingwood Football Club develop a clear pipeline for the development of talent from diverse communities into the club which proactively supports First Nations and people of colour into post-playing positions within the club and AFL, particularly coaching. 11, that its 
in its processes for the recruitment of board members and the recruitment of staff, including the playing group and coaches, so for everybody, the Collingwood Football Club ensures that it assesses candidates against key criteria, including genuine support for the club's values and anti-racism. 12, ensuring that the Collingwood Football Club board oversees a cross-club process of developing a culturally safe environment. Addressing the past, 14, that the Collingwood Football Club develop a strategy to address and reconcile past acts of racism in a way that is proactive and seeks to reward, not punish people who speak out against racism. 16, that an expert group on anti-racism be established and resourced to assist Collingwood Football Club board in the implementation of the recommendations and to oversee the evaluation of that implementation. Community leadership, 18, that the Collingwood Football Club develop a strategy led by its expert group on anti-racism to share its processes and reflections with the AFL community and works proactively to support the concepts of anti-racism and inclusion throughout the code. The executive summary glossed over the definitions of the loaded and emotionally charged language of social ju justice activism found within the report. Key terms like racism, structural racism, anti-racism, inclusion, diversity, culturally safe and proactive as used, are used as if they are assumed knowledge when in fact, as previously mentioned, these terms have competing meanings, both colloquially as used day to day and technical technically, as used within the institutions of academia and jurisprudence, as well as social justice activism. Only a pair of these terms are addressed, specifically with regard to racism and culture. However, this is done much later in the report. Before moving into the main body of the report, it is important to understand the ideological lens through which the authors are advancing their work and the linguistic tools they are using and the assertions underlying the, their premises. As clearly stated by the title of one of distinguished Professor Brent's books, Achieving Social Justice, the lead author is a self-proclaimed social justice activist. The academic theories that provide the framework for much of her work and others in the activist academic circles include critical theory and critical race theory. And I've got some definitions here from Stanford University and again, uh, the links to that will be below. Critical theory has a narrow and broad meaning in philosophy and in the history of social sciences. Critical theory, in the narrow sense, designates several generations of German philosophers and social theorists in the Western European Marxist tradition known as the Frankfurt School. According to these theories, a critical theory may be distinguished from a traditional theory according to a specific practical purpose. A theory is critical to the extent that it seeks human emancipation from slavery, acts as a liberating influence and works to create a world which satisfies the needs and powers of human beings. Despite the many histories of the implementation of Marxist theories caused, causing the deaths of hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century, critical theory is uncritically described as being of a Marxist tradition. Further in that vein, critical theory is adequate only if it meets three criteria. It must be explanatory, practical, and normative, all, the same, all at the same time. That is, it must explain what is wrong with current social reality, identify the actors to change it, and provide clear forms for criticism and achievable practical goals for social transformation. And further still, the guide says, quote, any Philosophical approach with similar practical aims could be called a, quote, critical theory, end quote, including feminism and critical race theory, end quote. In order to comprehend the magnitude of critical theory, consider the definition of critical. As an adjective, judging severely and finding fault. Also as an adjective, relating to or char characterised by criticism, reflecting careful analysis and judgement. Or well, there's another way to define critical as an adjective of the greatest importance to the way things might happen. This is the heart of the philosophy, to combine a method of criticism while simultaneously and explicitly elevating that method as being of the greatest importance in order to drive social change within a Marxist tradition.
And then again, looking at Stanford University's definition of race. As an example of this philosophy, the Stanford University philosophy website defines the term race in a 15,700 word essay that was first published in May 2008 with substantive revision in May 2020. This is the way things are going. Nothing in the article makes any concepts of race as anyone outside of the field might understand them to be. That your neighbours might look slightly different to you or may or may not be susceptible to certain illnesses or diseases or may or may not have slight differences in their metabolism in regards to certain types of pharmacology. Additionally, Stanford University also has information on critical race theory. Through its summary of the third book, Critical Race Theory, quote, critical race theory has become a dynamic, eclectic and growing movement of study in the study of law. With the third edition of Critical Race Theory, editors Richard DeLargo and Jean Stefanich, Stefanich have created a reader for the 21st century, one that shakes up the legal academy, academy, questions comfortable liberal premises and leads the search for a new way of thinking about our nation's most intractable and insoluble problem, race. It's an interesting way to look at race, isn't it? An intractable and insoluble problem. And quote, offering a comprehensive and stimulating snapshot of current race jurisprudence and thought, this new edition of critical race theory is essential for those interested in law, the multiculturalism movement, political science, education and critical thought. Okay, so in the report, Collingwood Football Club and Key Concepts, Racism, the report positions Collingwood as established in 1892 on Aboriginal land, and I would add presumably stolen, within a diverse and disadvantaged working class community that has, quote, a history that should speak to inclusion and anti-racism, end quote. The report expands a narrative of a long history of racism in the club, overtly starting in the 1970 VFL Grand Final where the Collingwood crowd booed Carlton player Sid Jackson. The report quotes GTV9 commentator, a GTV9 commentator that put the booing down to Jackson being, quote, a coloured man, we know, but he's entitled to every bit of self-respect that everybody's allowed, end quote. That's how the report commences the framing of Collingwood's history. What it doesn't mention is that a fortnight earlier, Jackson had struck Collingwood's Lee Adamson during the prior semi-final inside 50. Jackson accused Adamson of racial abuse and as such was let off by the judiciary. Jackson was booed for the punch, not for being black. In an interesting footnote, Jackson later apologised to Adamson for lying about the slur. There could be more to say about the interpreted history of the club, but that's the report's starting point, a false framing devoid of context. The report goes on to char characterise the image of Collingwood as being racist, an image gained through honest conversations with us, that's a quote from the report. In order to understand the character of those honest conversations, it is time to address the first of the key concepts introduced into the report, racism. Quote, popular understandings of racism often simplify something that is complex, nuanced and counterintuitive for those who don't experience it. For this report, we've defined these terms as interpersonal racism, direct racism, actions or remarks that occur between people or groups of people that intentionally or inadvertently express prejudice or bias against racial groups. An example of interpersonal racism is calling someone a racial slur, either with intention to express a racist sentiment or otherwise. Interpersonal racism is sometimes easier to see than structural racism, but is not always obvious to people who don't experience racism. Structural racism, indirect discrimination, occurs not through individual action, but through policy, institutional culture, representations in media, laws, conversational norms, and normalised behaviours. An example of structural racism is, is an informal expectations that athletes from non-white backgrounds be treated as natural athletes, rather than players with expertise or agency in the game." End quote. It is interesting to note the key differences between the definitions of individual and structural racism. Individual racism, racism is said to occur 
quote, against racial groups, end quote, while structural racism is, quote, policy institutional culture, end quote, which is to say that the definition has no object upon which it acts. That it is something separate in and of itself that is embedded within an organisation simply by being. Absent in the definition is any requirement that the institution express prejudice or bias or indeed action upon people or racial groups. This is a linguistic trick. To unpack this further, one might imagine a glass of water. Drinking a glass of water is an action that is analogous to individual racism in that it is an action upon something. In the definition above, the glass of water is in itself the racism, which is to say structural racism. Using this example, we see why the authors noted racism as, quote, complex, nuanced and counterintuitive, end quote. Through defining racism this way, the authors are able to define structural racism in such a way that no example is given of a specific structure or racist policy in the entirety of the report, but points to it as a problem requiring both systemic and proactive change and going on to reference it a further eight times. Indeed, the illustrations of, illustration of structural racism that is given is counterfactual. If, quote, players from non-white backgrounds were treated as natural athletes rather than players with expertise and ag agency in the game, end quote, they would not be required to attend training, participate in high performance coaching, sports psychology, etc. The illustration is patently ridiculous. To further examine this concept, it is worth considering the theory behind contemporary anti-racism. In Ibram X. Kendi's 2019 How to Be an Anti-Racist, Kendi describes racism such that, quote, to be a racist is to constantly redefine racist in a way that exonerates one's changing policies, ideas, and personhood, end quote. That is to say that unless specifically anti-racist, one is in fact racist. Further, Kendi defines racism as, quote, any idea that suggests one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group, end quote, and that also produce, that racism, quote, is a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalises racial inequalities, end quote. Thus, once these terms are defined, Kendi goes on to say that, quote, if discrimination is creating equality, it is anti-racist, end quote. Okay, this is at the heart of the anti-racist struggle. It is not a war against discrimination. Anti-racism is proactive and ongoing discrimination in order to produce equity. Discrimination along racial lines is now a good thing in order to fight against structural racism. One could interpret that the response to structural racism is structural racism. through genuinely racist structures. So those definitions are from page 17 and 18, 17, 18 and 19 of the book in the chapter definitions. At my local library, this book has been borrowed seven times since 2019. It should be noted that this book contains 238 pages of direct text, not including notes and references. And in those 238 pages, the author refers to himself 114 times. This book is marketed as a scholarly work, not an autobiography. This point is raised to highlight the introspective, self-referential and circular logic used by advocates within the field, that anecdote builds upon anecdote, with, which then forms the foundation for a skewed ideological worldview. The opposition to that view then becomes demonstrative racism. Recommendation 16 of the report says in part, an quote, expert group on anti-racism be established and resourced, end quote. We have examined the ideology that an expert group will bring to the table. That racism is in fact a set of ideas and actions that create their own structures. To deny that idea alone is racist because racism itself is institutional. Later in his book, Kendi goes on to say that, quote, to be anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of history requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness end quote 
This will be the express purpose of the expert group on anti-racism, to, quote, radically reorientate, end quote, the consciousness of the club. The report's authors state that, quote, where, while a set of values have been articulated, belonging, commitment, realising potential and caring, there was no clear and consistent sense of what the values of the club are, end quote. Interviewing 0.039% of the club's base is not consistent with approach on determining the club's values. Now that, there are, now that those values have been uh, cast as being unclear, they can be discarded and replaced with, quote, a clearer set of values that integrate concept of inclusion and anti-racism, end quote, via the report's recommendations and by extension, the expert group on anti-racism. Quote, an important observation was also made that in taking steps to address racism and encourage inclusion, there needed to be a greater appreciation of the complexities around diversity. Almost all the steps taken to improve the club focused on Indigenous people. While that was appropriate for a range of reasons, it meant that the different experiences, history and perspective of other people of colour, particularly those of African players, were not appreciated. End quote. What are some of those past steps to improve the club? Prior to commissioning the report, Collingwood created the Collingwood Reconciliation Action Plan. Within that document, we find a message from Reconciliation Australia's CEO, Karen Mundine, quote, Collingwood continues to play an important leadership role in growing community of over 1,000 organisations that have formally committed to reconciliation. With over 80,000 members and approximately 1 million supporters nationwide, Collingwood is in a prime position to make a deep and positive impact on reconciliation in Australia, end quote. And Karen Mundine uh, had previous roles, Mary McKellar board director, deputy chief executive and general manager, communication, engagement, reconciliation, senior consultant, CPR communications. She's worked in Prime Minister, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Foreign Affairs and Trade, okay, and obviously a serious person. And Reconciliation Australia was established in 2001 uh, and is a not-for-profit not body for reconciliation in the nation. Uh, is a national body, sorry, independent not-for-profit that promotes and facilitates reconciliation by building relationships, respect and trust between wider Australian community and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. So in the Reconciliation Action Plan, endorsed by Reconciliation Australia via Karen Mundine, their CEO, there is a message from Collingwood President Eddie Maguire. It said, it's in part, quote, through this RAP, Reconciliation Action Plan, we will continue to develop our Burrowan program to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people providing employment and education opportunities and tackling disadvantage through increased engagement and participation. At Collingwood, we believe in a society in which all can participate. We pro uh, participate, prosper and reach their full potential. Our ethos, side by side we stick together. Our ethos is, our purpose is to unify and inspire people through the power of sport. We seek to make a genuine difference in our community and play an important role in the reconciliation process." End quote. So what is the Burrowan program that was just mentioned there? And from the website, quote, the Burrowan program is key is the key Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community program run by the Collingwood Football Club Foundation. End quote. It goes on to say, quote, the program is delivered in two streams the Burrowan Direct Employment Program and the Burrowan Trainee Program. Each have operated with tremendous success over the past three years, having secured 46 full-time placements with a range of host employers, along with 15 AFL Sports Ready Traineeships and four full-time traineeships with AFL Victoria." End quote. And quote, the Burrowan Program also offers all Collingwood Football Club staff and players the opportunity to participate in cultural awareness training, end quote. In the introduction to the report, it acknowledged the time and advice of Collingwood. Okay, so in the introduction back to the, the report now um, authored by Brent, in its introduction, it in, quote, acknowledged the time and advice of the Collingwood Football Club and Integrity Committee members, uh, Jody Sizer. And Jody Sizer is a member of the club. According to the Herald Sun, Sizer joined the board in 2018. According to the club's website, quote, board member Jody Sider, Sizer, a founding partner and co-CEO of PricewaterhouseCoopers Indigenous Consulting, is a Jab, Jab Warung Dunjumata Watamara woman and one of the Australia's foremost Indigenous leaders. I'm 
Sorry, I'm just not used to some of these vowel consonant combinations here, consonant combinations. A lifelong Collingwood supporter who has been the chair of the club's reconciliation action plan subcommittee, Sizer has worked with tertiary institutions, governments, sports codes and major businesses in creating meaningful change for Aboriginal people. Sizer has qualified as a certified practicing accountant, possessing a strong background in corporate governments, governance and is a graduate of the Headland Leadership Program and the University of Australia of Melbourne's Asia Australia New Leaders Program, end quote. So presently, 12.5% of the Collingwood board identify as Aboriginal. Therefore, there is a strong over-representation of Aboriginal people on the board considering Victoria's demographics. From the 2016 census data from the ABS, there were 5.926 million people in Victoria and the Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people made up 0.8% of the population. And further, respondents had the option of reporting up to two ancestries on their census form. And for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people in Victoria, the most common ancestries were Australian, God bless them, 46.6%, they are Australian. English, 19.6%, Australian Aboriginal, 9.2%, Irish 7.2% and Scottish 4.6%. More specifically, we can examine the 2016 census statistics for the Collingwood Football Club itself. Quote, in, Colling uh, in Collingwood, Victoria, 51.9% of people were born in Australia. The most common countries of birth um, for people outside were Vietnam 4%, England 3.8%, New Zealand 3.5%, China 26 and Ethiopia 1.4. It is interesting to note that the 6.6% of Collingwood res residents come from just two identified Asian countries and make up a higher proportion of the population than either English or New Zealanders. It is evident that prior to the report Collingwood had made significant investments into issues of reconciliation and addressing racism through policy changes and outreach programs, many of which were not uh, are not detailed by me here. What is certain is that these measures have been dismissed by the report's authors as being, quote, not of themselves enough to, to shift structural racism within the club, end quote. The evidence or examples of which are not given. We remember from the activist ideological lens that the club is in itself an example of structural racism. In order to counter this, the club must become proactive and anti-racist. And per Kendi, quoted before, Quote, if discrimination is creating equity, it is anti-racist, end quote. Now onto the report's chapter, A Different Approach, A Better Direction. That's the title of the report uh, that outlines in details the actions the club must take. And uh, here's where we find more key concepts around culture, awareness, competence, and most interestingly, safety. The chapter, Proactive Responses to Racism, introduce recommendation four, quote, development of a clear set of Collingwood Football Club values that embrace the concepts, concepts of anti-racism and inclusion that will set behavioral standards within the club, end quote. The report makes no effort to define anti-racism. However, that definition has been provided from some of the ideological source material, such that anti-racism is, as Ken, Candy noted, quote, a radical choice in the face of history requiring, requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness." End quote. The requirement for a proactive policy is to ensure that racial consciousness is at the core of any framework or decision made and also to provide ongoing work for the expert group on anti-racism. Later in the section the report looks for guidance on quote, evolving norms and standards. These include the Charter of UN the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2006 Victoria, the report of the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, COVID-19, Systemic Racism and Global Protests, August 2020. These influential human rights documents can provide useful guides that are more specific about the protection of groups that are often missing from general anti-discrimination legislation, end quote. That is lifted entirely from the report. 
So no longer do the board of the export group on anti-racism need to confine themselves with individual instances of interpersonal relationship within the club. They are now to look to the UN, in, UN or indeed global bot protests as useful guides on issues that require addressing. This is exactly what the report means when it speaks of being proactive. Of the 18 recommendations made by the report, one is beyond reproach. That is seven. Quote, that the Collingwood Football Club implement a framework to ensure that there is accountability and consequences for acts of racism committed by members of the club community. End quote. And by community here, I would define that as being all of the employees, its contractors, uh, everybody like that. I mean, every serious business in Australia has um, has such a policy and has a, a policy regarding bullying that's, that would be exactly the same. If the report confined its definition to racism to interpersonal racism and narrowed its definition of structural racism to policies that did not indiv address individual racism, then recommendation seven would have been the beginning and the end of the report. Instead, the report uses vague definitions to Trojan horse the key concepts that lie at the heart of the report that sit outside of a reasonable person's expectations of a response to racism. Quote, key concepts, cultural awareness, training programs that educate about different cultures, cultural perspective and histories to create a deeper understanding of them. Cultural competence, the skills to deal with people from backgrounds and other than one's own, end quote. To explore more deeply the ideas around cultural awareness and competence, it is useful to look to the SBS, the Special Broadcasting Service, who advertise training in the area. According to their, their website, quote, maximise the benefits of cultural diversity in your workplace. The cultural competence, training, uh, comp cultural competence program, CCP, is Australia's leading online training course aimed at building capability around cultural diversity in the workplace. The CCP explores topics including cross-cultural communication, addressing stereotypes, unconscious bias, diversity, benefits of multiculturalism in the workplace. There are over 60 animations and films, including real people telling real stories. Also including, we also included our fun, interactive activities, plus options for further reading. Learning outcomes. Learning outcomes, individual learning outcomes are geared toward development, developing understanding in culture, diversity and inclusion through looking at some of the following. Ways that cultural diversity contributes to competitive advantage. Unconscious bias in decision making and how to remedy it. Different cultures' ways of thinking, acting and communicating. How the above is affected by values, attitudes and beliefs. How different people of different cultures adapt to new cultures. End quote. So all of that that I read there without inter uh, uh, interruption, and I, I did laugh at CCP because it does sound very communist. Um, it's, it's, that's all from their training and resources section on the culturalatlas.sbs.com.au, and I'll, again, I'll link that below. Clicking through the website's links can be noted uh, to the noted course material, a few examples of content and topics can be noted. Quote, unconscious bias, types of bias, effects on recruitment and career, groupthink, stereotypes, managing unconscious bias, cultural adapt adaptation, stages of cult cultural adaptation, impact on management, end quote. Okay, so that's some of the course content. Now, the Harvard University Implicit Association Test has formed the the basis for the notion of unconscious bias. The test does not produce repeatable results and has been savaged in scientific literature. The Chronicle of Higher Education uh, has the, or America's, largest newsroom dedicated to covering colleges and universities. Uh, as the unrivaled lever in higher education journalism, we serve our readers um, indispensable real-time news and deep insights plus the essential tools career opportunities and knowledge to succeed in a rapidly changing world. So that's from About Us, um, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and they have um, an article on here, Can We Really Measure Implicit Bias? Maybe Not, January 5, 2007, Tom Bartlett. And I'll link that quote, I'll link that, um, that article, but in that article, uh, Anthony G. Greenwald is quoted saying something in regard to 
the implicit association test, the implicit association test. But we just need to read who that is from the article. Um, Anthony Greenwald is a psychology professor at the University of Washington and co-author of the 2013 best-selling Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People, a book that's based on the implicit association test, a test that he helped create and has criticised the use of the implicit association test, an unconscious bias, saying that, to quote from the article, we do not regard the implicit association test as, as diagnosing something that inevitably results in racist behaviour or prejudice, end quote. Additionally, the New York Police Department notes in their report the impacts of implicit bias awareness training in the New York Police Department 2020, quote, the effects of training on officers' attitudes towards discrimination and their motivation to act without prejudice were fairly small. Though prior to the training, most officers considered discrimination as a social problem and felt individually motivated to act without bias, end quote. And another article, mandatory implicit bias training is a bad idea. It's all the rage, but the view in of some it's seriously counterproductive. And this is from Psychology Today, 2017, um, uh, from Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Justin Lee, uh, and it says, in, quote, implicit bias seems to be everywhere. What is it? Bias to your average layperson seems to mean something like prejudice or discrimination. Implicit is usually taken to mean unconscious or outside of awareness. So implicit bias is supposedly something like prejudice of which people are not even aware. However, the research on so-called implicit bias has its serious critics. Almost everything about the implicit bias, about implicit bias is controversial in scientific circles. It is not clear, for instance, that most implicit bias methods actually measure what, what they actually measure, their ability to predict discrimination is modest at best, their reliability is low, early claims about their power and immutability have proven unjustified, end quote. Okay, so this is taken off uh, despite this overt uh, scientific criticism to their uselessness. It should be obvious from the course material and the market, marketing material from SBS, um, one of the lead training providers in the field, that cultural awareness training and cultural competence are not learning about the peoples of the world and sensitively helping them to adapt to Australian culture, rather they are tools to reprogram quote one's unconscious bias end quote, such that it can be quote managed end quote through one's quote cultural adaptation end quote. The simple definitions of terms offered in the report are not that simple at all, but act as a gateway drug for the cultural imperialists to leverage their dogma across training and truth-telling struggle sessions recommended by the report and to propagate their ideas across the rest of the AFL. Through investigating concepts of cultural awareness and cultural competence, we are introduced to the report's key concept, quote, cultural safety, an environment in which a person from a diverse background feels valued and accepted, end quote. And later, quote, in working to create a culturally safe workplace, it is important to emphasise diversity. Often steps in relation to better understanding First Nations programs overlook other experiences and cultures. A focus on the cultural safety of people from diverse backgrounds, such as African or African descent, further improves the inclusiveness culture of the club." End quote. This paragraph and the definition of cultural safety focus not only on the cultural safety focus not on the cultural safety of the club, nor its expressed values of belonging, commitment, realising potential and caring, but of deliberate, proactive social rehabilitation of the club to protect and nurture the values of those exclusively from, quote, a diverse background, end quote, and how the culture of the club adapt to respect those cultures. The board have adopted the 18 recommendations of the report in full, and the final section of the report details specific responsibilities of board members and executives to implement and report on the progress of the recommendations. In conclusion, uh, a poet, Audrey Lord, Audre Lord, is often quoted as saying, it is not our differences that divide us, it is our inability to recognise, accept and celebrate those differences. That, that's the quote there. But I think it works both ways. The middle class women that dominate the university systems, 
radical and uh, gender studies fields fail to racial and gender studies fields I'm sorry racial and gender studies fields fail to recognize the universal truth in human behavior that respect and recognition work both ways attempting to impose middle-class aspirations upon hyper competitive elite male athletes and working-class men excludes the possibility of recognizing the differences between the cultures of institutions indeed the professors that create the report made no meaningful attempt to understand the culture of the club before imposing their own cultural ideals upon it. As such, their critique of the culture of the club is invalid. It is its own form of cultural imperialism, of cultural colonialism. The report carries the image of the UTS, the University of Technology Sydney, the logo, and was written by two eminent professors employed by the university. However, the report does not live up to any rigorous academic standards, carries no statistical credibility, and relies heavily on scare quotes to impart critical information that is relied upon to support conclusions and actions. Although dressed to appear as a scholarly work from a respected university, it is not. Further, this report demonstrates that diversity is not a strength. It is by its very nature divisive. This report has airbrushed Collingwood's Asian population from consideration as board members, coaching and technical staff, players and members. They are not addressed specifically in the report despite making up 6.6% of the population of suburb of Collingwood compared to the African population that is, specific, that is indeed specifically mentioned many times as are black and brown people, despite the 2016 census reporting 1.6% of the population coming from Ethiopia. By the report's own, own methodology and definitions, the report is structurally racist. This example highlights the author's fixation on dark skin, light skin narratives that are used as tools to wedge power out of an organization and to affect social change through cultural imperialism rather than through the ballot box or discussion. The leftists can only destroy, never create, and this report and its inherent and racist flaws are an example of this. Robin DiAngelo is a key promoter of ideas around anti-racism and recently wrote a very successful book called White Fragility. And I've got here an open letter to Robin DiAngelo about anti-racism from New Discourses, and I will link that below. And the essay says in part, quote, you will turn us against each other by teaching us to see how we're all complicit in a system of racism. You would have our children become obsessed with racism and poisoned with it. You do this so that you will not feel so alone. And for this crime against us and our children, we would like to sit down and have a word with you. Many of our children have been led astray, taught to obsess over race, to attempt to see it all around them in every interaction and every object around them. This has only happened in recent years under the educational direction of anti-racism advocates such as yourself. We're terrified. Those who have fully embraced this poison may be lost possibly forever. They're our children and they're already turning on us. Imagine for a moment how we must feel for every parent, every sibling experiencing this right now. We write this in the pale hope of saving them, not to save you and to stand in true solidarity with one voice, brown, white, and even black, to deliver a very simple message to you. You are wrong, end quote. And signed at the end of the letter, quote, a professional group of, Amer of brown Americans, if you must know, who work their way up in a free country. We cannot sign our right names because thanks in some significant part to you, we know that what will happen, we know what will happen if we do. Those who feel they can, can add theirs in the comments." End quote. Collingwood supporters. None of the language used in the report is used in a definition that you or I might understand it to be. These words have specific definitions within activist academia and these are the definitions that will be used when policy is created and implemented and it will be done in your name, pardon me, to your club and it will be aimed at you. In the never ending quest to find racism, to be anti-racist, the expert, guide on ra on anti expert group on anti-racism will analyse every aspect of the game and having done that, it will then look to the game itself. Is there enough diversity in passing and marking? 
are the share of inside 50s proportional to the diversity of the team? On and on and on it will go. Collingwood, do better.